afternoon. It's good to be here with you all, and um, we are recommending that you wear a mask while we're in here. I know we're going to be eating, and you can't wear a mask while you're eating. Um, we're not requiring it, but we decided the church council that when they spread, you know, the Ventura County um, Public Health, they put out a report every week, and this weather spread is 1.0 and above is means that it's spreading, and if it's less than one, it's not. So we thought, okay, whenever it's above one, we will recommend wearing masks. So um, I don't know how... You can all check that each week if you get the emails like I do. <laughs> but um, but if you don't have one with you, don't worry about it because it was not something that we had said previously. I don't have I it does it's really not compatible with the headpiece. Otherwise, I was wearing this around. But anyway, it's good to be here with you all for worship. And it looks like we have a huge feast for when we're done eating. So please stay for dinner. We have. At least three different kinds of chili, right? And then we have a lot of dessert, too. <laughs> and so um, and Karen's like, my favorite part. <laughs> so please stay for dinner. Um, I invite you to stand as you are able as we begin worship in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is still Easter. Did you know that? Uh, so... Our prayer of confession and forgiveness is for Easter still. Standing in the light of Easter, let us confess the ways we cling to fear, hold on to anger and regret, and continue to look for life among the dead. God of life, have mercy on us. We are afraid of loss and pain, and it makes us mean. We have put our faith in our own strength, our own cleverness, and the power of violence. Made to share love, we have become stingy with our joy. Blessed to bless others, we have cursed our neighbors instead. Called to live in freedom, we remain captivated by death. Have mercy on us. Raise us from our graves. And receive the good news, beloved. Christ is risen and you are free. Jesus' love is larger and stronger and more enduring than any power in the universe. In that power and in the joyous light of Easter, I proclaim to you the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, live now according to the promise and gift of resurrection through Jesus. Amen. We join in singing, O oh God, our help in ages past.
Let us pray. God of all wisdom, Paul knew how to sit with people in their own reality before bringing them along the journey of the story of Christ. Teach us to honor people's journeys with grace and respect. Amen. Please be seated and we will hear the first lesson. Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, Wayne, we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, this God who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is this God served by human hands as though God needed anything, since God gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and God allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for God and find God, though indeed God is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now God commands all people everywhere to repent because God has fixed a day on which God will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom God has appointed. And of this, God has given assurance to all by raising Jesus from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to John in the first chapter. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. 
The law was indeed given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we are gathered together, help us to bask in, to rest in those words, grace upon grace. As we reflect upon your word, help it to stir within us that desire and the ability to share your grace your love, where you have placed us. In Jesus' name, amen. I really have always liked this story from Acts. And um, so I, you know, thinking about it, as I always do, thinking about something all week and all week and you know, and sometimes you have your sermon in your head and then things happen that, like, there it goes. But um, not exactly that, but pretty close. But we're talking about idols today. So Paul is visiting Athens, and he, you know, is waiting for his friends, and so he walks around the city, tourist, looking at all the things. Um, it was interesting, this is the only city, according to one of the commentaries I read, that this is the only city that Paul did not get run out of. Um, but anyway, it, it, it looks very nice and polite, you know, in this story that Karen read for us, where they say, may we know this new teaching? It really wasn't that polite. It comes across that way, but they took him and brought him, so it was like, You come with us. A little bit scary, huh? Yeah. Sometimes we miss that that, that deepness. But he is talking then about idols, or he says to them, I see how extremely religious you are. And so I saw these objects of your worship. So an object of worship is where we would have the word from idol. I read a, a, an article in the Atlantic this week about um, how um, divisive the church, especially the white church, is becoming. And I was going to talk more about that. Um, one church went from, in Michigan, it went from 100 people worshiping each week pre-COVID to 1,500 people worshiping each week. Guess how they did that? by making themselves the church that says COVID the hoax. And, you know, and so so not all methods of church growth <laughs> are good. <laughs> but um, anyway, so we were, I was kind of thinking about that in terms of what, you know, things we have. And then I had this question to say, if Paul were to walk around in our church or our city, But today I added our nation. What would he think that we worship as a people? This is a a congregation participation Saturday. I mean, I have answers, but you all think about that. What if Paul was walking around? What would he think we are worshiping, Betty? Our own ideas. So like our idea, this is what I think. And who cares what anyone else thinks? This is what I think. Who cares if there's somebody more knowledgeable? Yeah, that's one, huh? (laughs) What else? What else would Paul say we are worshiping? Cars? Trucks? People spend hours loving them. People spend hours loving them. I can't get the dead bugs off my windshield, but... (laughs) What else? What else? Uh, Jen. Social media. 
Yeah, that's a hard one, isn't it? You, like, convict me with that one. Because <laughs> I go on social media way too much. Celebrities. What? Do they, are they the experts? Mm -hmm. Food? How do, we, how do we worship food? So the Epicureans, we might be Epicureans. You know, the, for the Epicureans, pleasure was the goal in life. Which, you know, food kind of gives pleasure until you eat too much and get sick, right? Robin, did you say something? Sick of that. What else? Money. So let me say, um, yeah. And sometimes, so if we want to, uh, like, take this a little bit deeper, an idol can be whatever it is you think is going to save you. What is going to save? I need this because it's going to save me. Any other thoughts on that one? Betty? Do we get in our own groups that we're comfortable with? That's a really hard one, isn't it? Because we're comfortable in our group. I do a, a um, I just invite people to go to Harmon Canyon on Tuesdays for Tuesday Trails, and um, I have everybody introduce themselves, even, and they all look at me like, we all know each other. I go, it's a really good habit. <laughs> um, because I heard someone once say on a podcast that she went to this running group in New York, and everyone was all in their groups. And she was new, and she didn't know anybody, she didn't know anyone's names, and so she always has everyone introduce themselves, and I'm like, that's a great idea, because we do get more comfortable in our groups. This what? If they use it, yes. And you know what? It can also become an idol if we use it wrongly. If we don't read it, but we say... Um, uncritically, no, there are people, so, so we don't always, people don't always read. We need to read what's in it. But the Bible itself can become an idol if we don't actually read it and engage it, but we just hold it as an object. I used to do a children's chat. I, don't, I maybe did it here before, but I said the best looking Bible is one that is falling apart and all dog-eared, and they're dirty, and it's got coffee stains on it, because it's being used and read. But if I take this really pretty Bible, and I just stick it up on the mantle of my house and say, I'm a Christian, see my Bible, it's kind of idolatrous in that way. So that's, but yes, the, to, away from my, to stay in God's word is really great for us. So my, um, political word of an idol today, which I've preached about this many, many times in the past, in this country, is guns. And this is where my sermon changed this afternoon. So I don't know if you know this, but last night, after the Milwaukee Bucks game, 21 people were shot in Milwaukee. And it was three different shootings and people shooting at each other. So it was, you know, when, you, when we start saying, oh, everybody should carry a gun, you might have, ha it's not safe. It's not going to save you. Today in Buffalo, a white supremacist, He's got his, he has actually a manifesto about they, you know, they, the, they will not replace us kind of stuff. Went into a grocery store in Buffalo where black people shop and shot 13 people, killing 10 of them. One of whom was an, a retired police officer guard. You've heard in the past people say, well, the only thing that's going to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. 
Now, the good guys with guns get killed, too. Um, the police officer who was a guard at a store in Boulder, Colorado, he was also killed. We have a, a sickness in this country around guns. And um, I don't know, some of you, a lot of you would remember, but some of you newer people with us, newer members, you wouldn't know that in the first few years I was here, I put up memorials every time there was a mass shooting. Do you know why I stopped? Too many. We could just put a memorial up and leave it there. Well, we did. Remember the cross, Teddy? Remember that wooden cross? And I left it out there, and I just kept adding ribbons to it, and the termites ate the bottom of it. <laughs> and that's why we don't have that wooden cross anymore. We have a real problem with the idolatry of guns in this country. And linked with that is white nationalism. And that kind of links with the article that I read this week in the Atlantic about the white church. We have a problem with racism in this country. And when you take that racism and remember, do you guys remember what I talked about a couple weeks ago? This is your quiz. Were you listening a couple weeks ago? Um, remember I was talking about language and dehumanizing language? And I said that using dehumanizing language will not lead, doesn't necessarily lead to genocide, but every genocide starts with dehumanizing language. This young man who went and killed these people was filled with dehumanizing language about black people. So what can we do? I think it's important for us to figure something out. We've been talking about it and praying about it for the entire time I've been with you. And it didn't start when I got here. I thought um, when 26 children were murdered at Christmas time that we would as a country say, wow, we gotta do something. That was like 10, 12 years ago. 10 years ago, it's a long time ago. And we just don't do anything. Paul says, when he got um, taken before the Are Areopagus, thank you, Karen. <laughs> and he said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. And because I went on my little tour and I saw this. And he might say that to us. I see how religious you are because you all talk about God. You all talk about life. You all talk about this. But then what happens? Where, what do we trust? I wish, I wish we could by ourselves just fix it. But we, together with other people, we can do things. But I think what happens is that the problem is so big that it's hard to do anything. I see heads nodding. It feels that way, doesn't it? After Paul talked to them about what he saw as their objects of worship and that they, were, they had a, 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 probably a statue to an unknown God, and he says, let me tell you who that God is. And Paul says, well, first, 
back up. He says, he made us all one, so we all came from the same place. One of the common children's uh, preschools, uh, chapels we do, especially at the beginning of the year, but we talk about all the time. Do we all have the same color? No. Do we all have the same hair? No. Do we all have the same eyes? No. No. None of us do. But we're precious exactly the way God made us. And we teach that because the children need to learn that they're precious exactly the way God made them. But we all need to learn also that God, my neighbor, comes from the same place is precious, even the neighbor that I don't like. And then Paul goes on to say that they're searching for God and perhaps they grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far. God is not far from each one of us. Sometimes when things are like like now and the problem seems so big and so insurmountable. It's like, where is God? God is here. I think when I read these stories over and over again about what, our, you know, what we do in this nation, I think of Jesus at Lazarus' tomb. God wept. For in God we live and we move and we have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, for we too are God's offspring. And since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art and imagination. And nor is what will protect something formed and made by human beings. But then Paul goes on to say, while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So Paul thought it was all done. And now 2,000 years later, we're all like, hey, are you hopefully still overlooking that time of human ignorance reminds me again of Jesus' words from the cross, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. In this whole speech, the way Paul addresses it, he's letting them know, he's letting the hearers know that he actually sees them. I see how religious you are. I see what is important to you. And I think that's an important piece because we all want to be seen, don't we? We don't like it when we're ignored. And maybe... Part of that answer is in us rededicating ourselves to seeing our neighbor. I know some of us have been uh, trying to learn more to, about the history of racism in our country. And um, I invite you, if you're interested, to join us in that. Because the, the racism that is at the root of what happened today in Buffalo was actually started by Christians. And so I think it's up to us as Christians to do something about it. And that starts with us learning ourselves what we don't know and seeing our neighbor. Paul ends his speech. This is probably a really long speech, and we're just getting the excerpts of it, because you know Paul liked to talk a long, long time. 
to the point where there's another story in Acts, if you're interested. He was talking so long that this kid fell out a window. He fell asleep and fell out a window, and he died, and thankfully Paul brought him back so that it wasn't a complete tragedy. But, but Paul concludes by saying, by calling for repentance. God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, and now he commands, commands all people everywhere to repent. To repent means to just go in a different direction. To say, this direction's not working. How about we go that way instead? And my hope and my prayer continues to be that we as a congregation join with other like-minded Christians throughout the country to combat racism, which is at the root of what happened today, but to also advocate, advocate for a solution to this um, idolatry of guns that we have in this country. I'm not anti-gun, but I'm anti-worshiping of guns. As we think about that, I think that, that we could have two reactions because you're like, oh, this is really hard. And it is. And God's call to us is not always easy, which is why Jesus said to count the cost. But it's scary. So we can look at the, 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 the world around us, look at these things, and we could repent by way of learning more and using our voices. Or we could look at these things and say, mm, it's just too big. I can't do anything. I'm just going to... The good news, ironically, is that it, whichever um, thing we choose to do, we have God's grace and forgiveness. Our salvation, so I talk about what's going to save us, is not contingent upon what we do or don't do. And that's, the, that's actually the really, really good news of the gospel, but it's also the scandal of the gospel. Because we like to like, hey, wait, that's not fair. You mean, you mean that person, God loves them just as much even though? You know, God loves this person who killed those people. That's a scandal. We can be thankful that God is the one who judges. But we also, in addition to having grace, we have one another, and that's a great gift. Because together, we are better at figuring it out than any of us is all alone. I heard a story this week, a couple of you heard this story this week, from somebody who... who um, saw, so remember I, I said at the beginning I put up a, a monument. I didn't do it all. I did some of them by myself. But after the Pulse nightclub um, massacre, 49 people murdered, we, some of us, um, got, uh, in fact, I should pull, I've got more of those crosses back there still because I couldn't bear to throw them away. But we made 49 crosses, and we painted them the colors of the rainbow, and then we put them out on the lawn. And I put, we did 49. We had enough to put 50 out there, but we only put 49 because I could not at that point put that 50th cross for the person who was the murderer who died. But then in worship the, the, on Sunday, we talked about it. You guys remember that? We talked about it in worship, and we talked about God's grace being that perfectly free gift. And so after worship, 
Mike Blankenship went and put the 50th cross out on the lawn. Well, someone I talked to this week said that they remember all those crosses, and for them, that's an indication that this church is a safe place. It might seem like a small thing, but it's not. It's a huge thing. And maybe the answer is not putting more crosses out on the lawn. But I think that together we can come up with some things to do and to say in ways to be. All the while remembering that we are recipients of God's grace. We don't have to do anything to earn it. The reason we do it is because we, we make the world better for us. When we make the world better for our neighbor, it's better for all of us. Together we can be a powerful message of God's grace. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. We join in singing. Shout to the north.
we prepare for prayer, um, I invite you to refer to the prayers. I, I'm going to work on getting them in here. <laughs> but they're in the grace notes we've emailed to you on Friday. Um, I update my friend Kathy is not in the hospital anymore, which is good news. So she's at a skilled nursing facility. So apparently there, there's different levels of those. So she's got to graduate to the next one. Um, but and keep her in prayer. Um, keep add in our prayers, uh, victims of gun violence and also um, victims of the, of the racism that is so prevalent in our country. Other prayer concerns? Jane? Oh. Are there prayer concerns? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for grace upon grace. And as we are gathered together in worship today, we pray together for the church, for the world, and for all those who are in need. Lord God, your servant Paul is a model for approaching the other and sharing the gospel in a spirit of generosity and openness. May we follow Paul's lead and respectfully accompany those whom we serve, rather than preaching without listening or insisting that others agree with us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Creator God, we too are your offspring created in your very image to give glory to you. Male and female, we are created. Forgive us when we try to recreate you in an image of our own choosing for reasons which do not honor you and return us to our true identity as your beloved children. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, there are fewer and fewer places like the Areopagus where each may share their own experience and have their views heard and accepted. We are quick to judge, disqualify, and justify rather than opening ourselves to being transformed in the presence of one another. Expand our horizons to include more than just those who agree with us and whom we consider part of us. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing, when assumptions and self-righteousness are released, healing can begin. Free us of all that holds us prisoner without our realizing it. And make us agents of your renewal. Bless today those who we bring before you, those whose names are listed in our grace notes, those we've named before you, those whose names we hold in our hearts. We pray for healing, for peace. Lord, in your mercy. God who calls us. We are a di uh, we throughout the world are a diverse group, and you call us saints. Thank you for making each one of us different from one another, and help each of us to see our neighbor as your beloved, and help us to be united in your love and redeemed by your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, as we look at our world today, 
We look at the news today, we see victims of gun violence this afternoon, victims of gun violence last night, victims of gun violence every day. It's become so common, it hardly makes the news. Help us to find a better way. And we pray for all of those victims of gun violence that they be comforted in their grief of for losing loved ones. For those who are injured, we pray that they receive the medical care and healing that they need and that they receive the funds they need to pay for it. We pray that you would lead all of us to commit ourselves to do what we can to end the scourge of racism in our country, in our cities, in our churches. Help us, Lord, to be empowered by that grace upon grace we receive from you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we have indeed received grace upon grace from you, our loving God. Accept these prayers and use them to transform our hearts and our lives and to transform the hearts and lives of those around us. Together we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. And I invite you to share that peace in whatever way is comfortable for you.
please stand as you're able. Let us pray. Life-giving God, you call us by name and we are yours. Give us the courage to answer your call. Help us to live by your terms, life, not death, love, not fear, open hands, not clenched fists. Remind us that everyone has a place at your table and all can be fed. We pray in the name of Christ who lives. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks for it. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks for it and he gave it for all to drink saying, in this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which has been poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And gathered together as Jesus' disciples, called and loved and receiving grace upon grace, let us pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We will join in singing Lamb of God, and then I invite everybody to come forward to receive communion. If you can't come up, we will bring it down to you. Thank you. 
Please stand as you are able. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that you make your home with us, bringing heaven to earth in this holy meal. Fill us with your spirit as we go from here, that we may wipe away tears, tend to those in mourning and pain, seek the healing of the nations, and bring to earth the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And you can sit down just for a couple of announcements. Actually, today I only have one announcement. Oh. Well, actually two. Don't forget to join us for chili tonight. Uh, we have lots of it, lots of good chili, cornbread, and lots of good desserts. And next Saturday is our uh, fellowship breakfast at 9 a.m. We will be serving quiche and I think a frittata and maybe some bacon. And so everyone come and join us 9 o'clock next Saturday. Awesome. And um, I mentioned it when we in my sermon, but we are starting a new book uh, next Sunday, the 22nd at 9 o'clock is when we meet. And the book is by Clint Smith and it's called How the Word is Passed. And he's an excellent writer. I think it, it won a bunch of awards last year for a really well-written book. But he goes to 10 different places and tells the story of those places. So we learn a lot of the history of, of um, enslavement of people and racism in, that continues to plague us. And it's very, I've read about half of it, but we will read, you know, a chapter and then we talk about it. And we really have good discussions and we really do learn and grow um, from one another. Julie? Oh, yeah, and you can join us on Zoom as well, but let me know if you're coming so I remember to turn it on. <laughs> All right, please stand as you are able. God, the author of life, Christ, the life, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen. amen. We go out singing, Thine the Amen.
Lord God, we pray your blessing upon our meal. We are thankful for those who prepared it, and we are thankful for the opportunity you give us to gather together to talk and to share. In Jesus' name, amen. The grave is empty. Our Lord is loose out in this world. Go in peace and live in freedom. Praise be to God.